What do we have to do to make Agile tangible for our executives? How do we get our executives to have more confidence than fear in the changes that we're trying to make? Because the reason they don't move with us is because they don't understand it, they don't trust it, and we're making it more difficult by not answering the things that are required to get to trust. So when I was um, seven years old, uh, we moved from Huntsville, Alabama, where my dad was working on the Apollo missile systems. My, my dad is a rocket scientist. And we went to um, Georgia Tech, and they installed a nuclear reactor in Georgia Tech. And that nuclear reactor had a PDP-8 computer from a company called Digital. Any of y'all ever heard of Digital in here? It's like an old, old company. And I learned how to program on a PDP-8 at seven years old, and it was attached to the nuclear reactor underneath the university campus in downtown Atlanta. I thought it was really unreasonable that Dr. Harmer and my dad wouldn't let me load the tapes that loaded the programs into the computer. I thought it was ridiculous, because I could do it. I was writing programs. I, was, I could only load data. And it was cool, they were paper tapes. I don't know if it was like a paper tape reader instead of cards. They didn't have digital tapes back then. I thought it was very unreasonable of them not to let me load tapes, not to load programs into the computer. In retrospect, I realized there was probably some pretty rational thinking going on, on their part, not letting a seven-year-old um, just arbitrarily load programs into a computer attached to a nuclear reactor. You guys okay with that? It didn't make sense to me at the time, and I couldn't explain to them why it was important. Later on, I was in the Marine Corps, and um, I thought bosses were ridiculous in the Marine Corps, and I wondered why they had all these ridiculous controls and rules and things over me. But it turns out that it was actually pretty important if you're going to put a 19-year-old kid in pretty chaotic circumstances with a lot of people's and equipment responsibility. There's got to be some rules around it. So does that resonate with you all? As I grew into becoming a professional, and I thought all my bosses were ridiculous, just absurd. I'm completely unemployable. That's why I have my own company. Not my own company, but I'm part of a bigger company that I helped found, right? So, so one of the things that we learned over time, though, is there was a reason for all those ridiculous rules when you're the boss of a company, too. One of the challenges that I think that we run into when we say um, executives don't care about Agile, there's a talk that um, executives are the number one problem with making Agile transformation happen in organizations. Have you all heard that thread in the community? Managers are evil. They're, de they're intentionally trying to destroy our ability to perform. Do you think it's possible that there may be some reasonable and rational behaviors for those executives, those managers, people that are obstructing what we're doing? You guys get that? I think that's a really important sort of thread for us to follow because I don't think that we always pay attention to that. And in fact, we go, to, we go to these conferences and we talk about how managers are bad and executives are evil, foolish people that just want to derail the company. That's probably not true, right? So what can we agree on? Organizations have to be able to move at market speed sustainably. And that's a faster and faster and faster pace. We agree with that? Um, old ways of working won't solve it, but Scrum and DevOps and FineOps and uh, ProdOps and whatever we're calling it, those things are not successful, are not sufficient. A bunch of practices are not sufficient to create the organizations that we need. Everybody agree with that? To make the changes that we have to make, we need executives to buy into doing stuff they might not be comfortable with. Right? Everybody okay with that? And executives are not intentionally trying to make you fail at your job. Do y'all believe that? Or does it feel that way some days? Yes, right? That's not need or a question. <laughs> it's a sliding scale. Um, why don't executives participate? I didn't mean to click that. Why don't executives participate in uh, our transformations? Why do they obstruct what we're trying to do as we're trying to build organizations differently? What sort of experiences do you have with executives getting in your way, and why might they be um, resisting? They don't get it. They don't get it. Okay. Maybe they're too busy. They're too busy. Good. Cost too much. Cost too much. Fear. Fear. Fear is a good. That's a good thread. You don't speak their language. So you've you've read my slides. Different concerns. <laughs> Different concerns. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes. Our goals may not be aligned. Our goals probably aren't aligned. Yeah, so, so who's responsible for closing that gap? Is it their responsibility to come to us? Or should we be participating and trying to move them in the right direction? Sort of a shared responsibility. 
Do you think throwing conferences saying that managers are evil and executives are foolish moves those executives closer to us or further away from us? Or the literature that we read? What's that? It's up to us. I agree, Steve. So what do we know doesn't work at this point? Have y'all, y'all have some experience trying to get executives to follow you and they haven't followed you? Give, some, give me an example of something you've tried that didn't work. What doesn't work? Yeah, so let's come back to, we'll get a chance at the end probably. Let's talk about why estimating an hours is absolutely critical to what they're responsible for. And why you can't do it without it. Yep. Talking at high level, like, this is the mindset, this is what you need, and they care about, you know, being profitable. Yeah. I like this one, just trust the teams. Yeah, just trust the teams. Just trust us. Give us everything we need and trust us. That's what the Agile Manifesto says. Right? How about, um, let's just let the teams decide how to work. No controls, no responsibility. Meanwhile, the guys at Equifax that are just getting out of jail from the data breach a couple years ago, <laughs> right? Don't feel totally comfortable with that. All right? Um, you'll get what you get when you get it. Right? Shareholders don't care. Markets don't care. Customers don't care. Just, it's impossible to estimate. Just work on it as hard as you can. I'll be completely comfortable when you get it done. Right? Um, here are some books you need to read. Y'all, have y'all tried that one? <laughs> Here's an article. Here's a conference you could go to. Just go to this two-day course. Yeah, just go to this two-day course and you'll get it. We need y'all to be agile yourselves. Start doing stand-ups and thinking, like, we need to, to change your behavior. Right? Do, you, do any of those things actually help us solve the problems that get executives in the way? They're all pretty much plain. Yeah. So what's interesting is, what do we have to do to make Agile tangible for our executives? How do we get our executives to have more confidence than fear in the changes that we're trying to make? Because the reason they don't move with us is because they don't understand it, they don't trust it, and we're making it more difficult by not answering the things that are required to get to trust. So having deep empathy for the classes of problems they're trying to solve understanding what matters to our managers, our directors, those executives, having a point of view to showing them how moving through our model will help them get more of what they need. The thing I talk about, are y'all familiar with the ladder of inference? There's a really cool tool that talks about what people act, how they act, what they believe, what they've experienced, what data they have. We can't argue with people at the um, what you believe point. You're wrong. No, you're wrong. We've had, this. We've had this argument. No, you're just wrong. No, I'm not. I'm right. No, you're wrong. Right? You have, to, you, have to, you have to be able to go way down and understand what they believe and then reframe a point of view about what might be possible if you tried something different. So we have to be able to take their beliefs apart. And if we don't start with what they believe, we're not going to get there. Um, once we've got a reframe point of view, then we have to create a tremendous amount of safety for them to be able to have the conversation about what we might try. And we have to work our way up a path. So I'm going to talk about four elements that I think are necessary in that conversation to get us permission to try something, and then how we might try it and earn permission to try something bigger, because it's not a one-time flip either. Is that good? If, you're, if, you, if I leave some, that'll be valuable for you if we learn some of that? Cool. So I'll get to it. Executives aren't trying to deliver software to their customers. Executives aren't in little boxes of problems. These, they're dealing with lots of complicated problems that are often in conflict with each other. The regulatory and compliance stuff is often in conflict with speed, right? Having strategies and budgets that we can communicate to the markets and achieve are often in conflict with learning and adapting. Right? I had a client, they used to say the cotton starts growing in March. We start selling in July and the cotton starts growing in March and we have no optionality from the point that we start marketing to when the cotton starts growing because people start arranging financing, buying things, they're clearing their fields and preserving cash to plan for the next season's release. So we can't get what you'll get when you get it. If we say you're gonna have it, we need to frickin' have it. Does it make sense? Cotton starts growing in March. And these problems are super complicated. Our technology is getting in the way of our ability to deliver. Our, do y'all have infrastructure and operations people that are opposed to doing DevOps in your organizations? You know, why is that? because we don't know how to have them do it safely. They're responsible for protecting something. It's in direct conflict with what we're trying to accomplish sometimes. 
Now, it's, now if it's all one person's problem, that's cool. But when we're looking at agile or scrum or small problems, we're not thinking about the big systems and all the concerns that might be in place. So I think it's really important for us as we look at these challenges and you're looking at it from an executive or a manager or a leader, we want to look at all the challenges they're addressing and where they might have a conflict. I also think it's important that, just like us, most of these executives are trying to get promoted or get their bonus or take care of their families. And if they put themselves at risk for us and we don't deliver, those things get jeopardized, right? It's also a big win, but if we walk in and naively don't put ourselves in their shoes first and think about the big complex view that they're dealing with, we're not gonna be able to move them towards safety toward us. Good with that? So I think this is interesting to think about the big picture of all the pieces that are in place as we're having these conversations. So the first item in thinking like they think is to care about what they care about. So executives are charged with, I think, three big broad things. There's more, but let's go with three for right now. Generally, making money for the company today and in the future. They often have commitments for it. They're paid for it. Um, the, they have, they're, they're hired to do it. Making money is critically important for organizations. Success in the marketplace, they've got to go win customers, they've got to grow in the marketplace, they've got to increase our brand awareness, there's all kinds of things executives care a lot about. And the health of the firm, and executives do care about the health of the firm, but it looks difficult sometimes when we don't give them answers how to resolve those competing concerns. As a matter of fact, most of the things that freeze us in transformation are trying to protect health because we haven't shown them how we can move to a new place at least maintaining safety or increasing the safety in the move. And we're not thinking about it, we're just, we're just right. And so we're operating from I have the right answer and you're stupid, behavior, belief sort of part in the ladder of inference. So we have to be able to take it all the way down and care what they care about. If we can begin to connect what we're doing with trying to bring incremental and iterative market sensing, uh, adapting to the market in a sustainable sort of fashion, thinking, and can tie it to these things, you got a chance. If you can show how what you're doing gets in the way of these more than the thing we're gonna take them to, you have a chance to have the conversation. If you can't do that, you're dead in the water. So what can we do with Agile that helps us accomplish the things on the right there? We talk about predictability. When we walk in and say, it's impossible to estimate, you don't know when you're gonna get this stuff delivered, so we'll just do the best that we can, that is not gonna resonate with that executive that's responsible for making promises to the market, to their customers, to their families about their bonuses. We gotta be able to deliver what we say we're gonna deliver when we say we're going to. And it turns out that incremental and iterative delivery, small feedbacks, creating options, learning and adapting early, is absolutely the best way to be able to deliver big complex projects predictably. One of the stories that I tell is I was working with a big uh, agriculture company that was trying to put something to the ground in March. And we started our project in July and I came into a board meeting about two months in, and I said, here's the thing. We can't deliver what you promised to the market the way that you promised it. But I've got three options for you how far we can meet what your expectation is, but it isn't possible, the science doesn't exist, to put that software on that device, on that tractor connected to that camera, and make it work before March so we can ship it. Impossible. So what are you gonna do? Um, here's three options, and the guy, his name's Lyle, spinning his glasses, thumped the table and said to me, I knew this agile stuff wouldn't work here. We never have these types of problems with our traditional projects until they're 80 or 90% of the way done. <laughs> <laughs> so following my advice of not condescendingly scoffing at him and laughing, um, so I could actually encourage his engagement moving forward, I said, I think we're in a better place then, right? And he thought about it for a minute. In fact, we moved forward. He actually laughed about it later. He felt stupid saying it but it was actually what popped into his head in the moment, right? Right, I knew early that we were gonna fail. We had driven down risk early. We had done it the way that we thought it was possible would fail, and I gave him some options. Now, who wouldn't rather have that in their pocket than going dark for nine months and coming back a week before it's supposed to ship? We have a customer, I just flew back from Brussels Monday. I'm not even sure what day it is. Was today Tuesday? I flew back Sunday from Brussels, and, um, um, one of the challenges they had, was they had a product that was supposed to launch, and they found out two days before the launch, $30 million of market branding in place, that it's a six-month delay. 
Do you think that was knowable a little bit earlier and some optionality could have been created around it? Yeah, right? But because of the way they're running their stuff, they didn't know. So predictability is critically important. Quality is critically important. We get better quality out of Agile because we test it more often, we do it more frequently. We understand the math and the science of smaller batch validation instead of giant last minute validation. It kind of goes to the options and predictability side of it. So we get better quality out of Agile when we do it well than we do when we don't. But if we go in and we try to sell automated testing and test-driven development and pair programming and DevOps and test data automation, all those sorts of things, those aren't interesting to an executive. But improving my quality so I can make more money or be more successful in the market or have options in performing or increasing the health of my product, we can connect it there. Does that make sense? All these moves have to be connected. We can talk the same about early ROI, lower costs. Why does, why does Agile give us lower costs? Do you all know how Agile gives you lower costs in your enterprise? Less rework. A lot less rework. Faster delivery of value. Faster delivery of value. It'd be a lower ROI, but it's a, that's a fit, right? Efficiency, yep. Catching problems sooner. Catching problems sooner. Yep, it gives you options to understand. Yep, absolutely, the overspending. We don't, have to build, we don't have to build everything that we thought they meant by something. When we first got started, we can build just enough and see if it's enough, and if it's not, add a little bit more. The amount of software that gets overbuilt in organizations is unbelievable. Fewer handoffs, too. Fewer handoffs. We reduce the overhead. We see 30 and 40% reductions in overhead in organizations by making their organizations flow with an agile fashion. Now, executive would like that, wouldn't they? Right, Get, make more money sooner, I'm in for that. How do I do that? Well, don't need to go into the details, but this Agile Scrum stuff sort of does that. And then we just have to go prove it again and again and again, right? We're not gonna send them to a CSM class and get that sort of buy-in. Um, how does Agile work with innovation? It's interesting. In big companies, they're building big projects. How does Agile help with innovation? What's the difference here? In big, what's that? Fewer hand Fewer handoffs. If I, have the, if I have optionality built into my planning horizons and something really great and exciting comes up, have y'all ever been in a company, I know this hardly ever happens, where a great new big idea comes in or a customer shows up with a new order and you have to go do that plus everything else you were committed to doing because it's already in flight and you can't finish anything and get to a point to slip it in. So you just have to work on everything now. Does that work pretty well for y'all? <laughs> right? So what's cool about this is we can create the... That optionality idea, that innovation idea, is really important to a lot of executives too. There's stuff that's going to come up, and we can maximize the value we're producing, but if something comes up, we can operate in a way that creates a space for you to slip it in. So these are things that I can create. This is a way more compelling story from an executive standpoint in every regard, or from a management standpoint, if you're trying to get somebody promoted who can go have these conversations and we can deliver on it. It's a way more compelling conversation than telling them they need to have small teams or care about each other more, or all the kumbaya stuff, which is critically important and matters. I just went to systems of, in, systems of compassion. Totally agree with the concept and the content. Totally agree that we have to design organizations to take care of our people, right? But when we're actually going and setting our teams up to fail, we're not doing that, are we? We're not building systems that executives don't trust. They're not gonna be, build systems of compassion, they're gonna stand the systems of domination sort of model. Right, these things are all connected. So we have to get people to believe what matters them. But at the end of the day, these things matter. So care about what they care about. Speak their language. What is the language of business? Money. Money. It's actually interesting, you know, 50 years ago, um, oh no, and some of those people are saying the language of business is the customer's language, which I think is cool. And it's, and it's probably true and probably accurate, but it's not what gets moves in most organizations. But I think it still matters. So we're gonna say down here, the language of the customer and market success is still critically important. But if, but if you do that and you don't make money, you're not gonna move the organization. So these two things have to be connected as well, right? So if we can do Agile, and we can deliver more frequently to our customers and deliver more of what our customers want and less of what they don't, and have uh, uh, the ability to respond to market changes that are coming, we can increase the revenue for the firm. We have to be able to make that connection end to end. So speak the language of the business. We can do that through strategic objectives and OKRs and KPIs and things like that. How many of y'all are doing like OKR work? 
Oh, fewer than I thought. It's interesting. Um, how many of y'all are doing like KPIs and measuring KPIs in your organization? Is that the same hands? Pretty cool. How many of y'all don't have a way of measuring the ability of the organization to improve, to do a better job of making money? What if we walked in and said, here's, here's something that's possible, right? We can start talking about how we can keep track of this stuff and the changes we're making, we can connect it to more revenue for you. It may not be a perfect connect the dots, it may be, but, but I can show you a model that'll work consistently. It'd be pretty interesting, wouldn't it? We talk about productivity, work in the system. So we got market success, work in the system. Here's how much we can produce in a period of time. Here's how much we can produce in the next period of time. The things that you're asking me to do will either increase the number of things that I can produce in the next period of time or reduce the number of things I can produce in the next period of time. Like that's a conversation that you can have with an executive that's meaningful. They'll look at it and they'll go, I'd like to produce more things for the same number of dollars in the next period of time. Well, these things will help you get there. Then we can measure it and prove it. Ties up to our productivity or efficiency numbers. I can reduce your risk of missing your mark. I can reduce your risk of building something a customer doesn't want. I can reduce your risk of missing a commitment to the market. I can create tremendous transparency and optionality in the system to allow you to deal with the uncertainty in the marketplace. That's what we're doing with Agile. How many of y'all are talking this way to your executives or making these types of moves or, or, or have a, an opportunity to have these conversations? How many of you don't think you have an opportunity to have these conversations in your firm around this stuff? opportunities? Well, I, I think it's interesting. Yes. So you can, you can do it in a small circle, but you want to be able to do it in a bigger circle. It needs to happen in an even bigger circle to get some of the changes that we need. So the plan over time is to figure out where you can operate, and where you can have these conversations, make this available, leverage your partners, lever, leverage the, the directors and executives and vice presidents that you're working with, help them be successful, give them the ammunition to, to tell the story bigger and bigger, and then deliver on it every single time, or most of the time. CapEx efficiency, um, transformation. We're going, to make the op we're going to make the system work better. We're going to have less rework in it. We're going to have less overhead in it. We're going to get things to the market with fewer um, non-consumable features, non-performing assets being deployed. We're not going to build stuff you have to throw away as much. I can actually increase your balance sheet's value with this model. Um, we can elevate the competency of the people in your organization demonstrably through our transformation, and that elevation of competency will result in better throughput, your ability to achieve better strategic objectives, and eventually connect to more revenue if your strategy is correct. Is this path making sense? So talk about what the business cares about. None of this is about Agile or Scrum or stand-ups or product ownership or DevOps or any of that stuff, right? Now, we have to get there, and you have to know in your mind how you're producing this, but every slice of promise we make has to be wrapped up in a bit of a business case. Create safety for your executives or your vice presidents or the directors that you can influence. And we create, we align on purpose as the first step of creating safety because we're not gonna get to do anything if they don't feel safe about it. The risk of not moving has to be greater than the risk of moving. The fear of being static has to be greater than the fear of trying something new, All right? So what do we do first? We agree on a purpose. How are you going to be able to prove what you need to prove with this move we're about to make? How are we gonna do this in a way and tell the story around it so when you're done with it, uh, it looks like we were successful in one of those top two stories. We're gonna do this thing, we're gonna get this result, and you're gonna look smart because we did it. So aligning on purpose. Devise a credible plan. Did I spell credible right? That's good, It's good. It was spelled wrong at one point. I, I, I'm sure it was uh, Siri that did it. I wouldn't type a word in wrong, so. I'm sure I got typed in wrong from Siri. But devise a credible plan. Um, I hear a lot of conversation about Agile should be organic, it should be bottom up. Um, we don't know when it's going to happen. It's a chaotic system. It's a complex system. You can't plan or predict things. That just isn't really a viable approach if you're trying to get your boss to step into it. So what you have to do is you have to scope the change that you're going to make down to something you know you can commit. Get a purpose of what you're going to solve for. 
do a small enough slice on this, you can do a credible plan, come up with an answer. We think about 90 days to 120 days, it's about the horizon you get to prove something in an organization, a relatively small slice, and it can't put the entire organization in jeopardy. So what's a relatively small thing look like? What's it look like to be successful there? And then what does it look like? How are we gonna check in every two weeks to make sure we're making progress in it? You know, what's interesting to me about this approach so a lot of the executives you're talking to are product people or business people. And product people and business people get this when they're trying to sell something into the market or get a customer to move, right? Or change uh, the, the a relationship with a vendor or a supply chain. They get that you don't know the perfect end state. You can have a conversation about how you want to shape this and move with them to, here's what we think we have to do. Here's what we think we'll get there. Here's the plan we're going to put behind it. Here's how we're going to measure it and keep track of it. Incorporate feedback. We are going to learn as we're going. We are going to be able to get feedback from you if you think we're off track, or feedback from you. So a cadence of reviews of the moves that you're making and whether you're getting progress or not and what you're learning and what they're hearing. Keeping your executives or whatever level you're working with involved in the shift that you're making. Because it's gotta be their play, not just your play. Or have them participate in it. So you're getting their feedback then connect actions to their success. The things that we're doing produce this result, and that result was we, we won the thing that said we would win, and we get more influence. So this is kind of talk about the influence trust cycle, if you've ever seen that. Got some talks on it. I thought about putting it in there, but it's a whole hour talk on its own. We're sort of walking that trust cycle, influence cycle, because you gotta earn your way up the influence cycle. And then help them see how they contribute to the success and engage them in the prod, prod progress towards the goals. This is how we're getting our executives to buy into where we're heading and what we're doing. So there's a process you can put in place. And here's something you guys kind of know. It's a backlog with an objective, sliced up in relatively small slices with some really clear acceptance criteria where the team puts together a plan and delivers it, demonstrates the value, gets feedback from their stakeholders. You understand this model. You just don't know that your organization is a product and that you're gonna manage your stakeholders the same way that our product and executive people are managing customers. So think about it that way. You understand this process. It looks scary, but it's what you do. Here's what's interesting to me, by the way, and I struggled with this for a while. I think that if you don't understand that Scrum is a change management for your customer's model, incremental to delivery with lots of feedback cycles, is a creating safety for your customer's model, that's really hard to coach Scrum well. It's really hard to get into an organization and get them to move. We're just going through the mechanics of it. But if you deeply understand that it's a social thing that we're doing as much as a technology thing, that's why Scrum works when it works well. And it's why it doesn't when we don't know that's what we're doing. Right? It's not the mechanics of it, it's the creating safety for all the people involved. The team has some safety, they can stay in a box, gonna get to protect quality. Customer has safety that we're not gonna run down the road and disappear for nine months and come back with something they don't know. We're not spending money wildly and not knowing where it's going. Scrum and Agile creates a lot of safety for people. We're gonna do the same thing with our change approach to get our executives to buy into the moves that we're making. Is that kind of cool? Y'all are really good at this already. And then demonstrate results. We said we were gonna do it. We showed how it was gonna to tie together. We connected together, paying attention all the time to what you're measuring and proving so that your management of the change, we're making progress on the roadmap. Here's the work that we're producing. Here's the options we said you would get. Here's the data we said you would show. Here's some simulations or examples of producing the type of thing that we said we would. So managing the change and then connecting the value. And look, we moved this OKR. And look, the customer bought that. And look, we reduced this cost. And look, we had the lower quality. So when you're planning that plan up front, when you're doing that reliable plan, you gotta be making a plan about something you know you can deliver within the scope you have agency for. Because the goal is to work your way up. And what's interesting is, you won't have agency up front to do all the things you want to because your executives won't give it to you. But you can't go tell them to give it to you until you prove that they should trust you with it. So we're building up trust over time by making this be real and actual to them. We're letting them understand the changes that we're making. So the reason your executives won't trust you is because we haven't given them a reason to trust us in this work. Even though we may be exactly right, but not in their language, not in their experience, and have any of y'all, this, this might be a far reach too, have any of you been involved in any kind of Agile or Scrum or DevOps implementation that didn't quite deliver the business value it was promised? 
right? So they sign it up to trust you off, of, off the backbone of that, right? So we're going to establish a new way of working into it that gives them a lot of safety and feedback to follow it. So this is kind of the how do we do it. And then I have time for questions here at the end. Well, how long do I go till? 40, 40 after? I've, I've, I've wanted to leave 10 minutes, so. Build a business case. Involve the business. Spend time talking to your executives. Understand what is strategically important to your division, your department, your executives, depending on the size of your organization. And connect this and make it be something that the organization must do to increase their chance of succeeding and what's strategically important to them. So build a business case. Make it measurable. The number of scrum masters uh, established is irrelevant. The number of scrum teams is irrelevant. The number of defects shipped to customers, relevant, right? The time to value, relevant. Anecdotal stories, this major thing came in, it didn't break the whole world, we were able to bring it in, gave you options and you made the right choice, relevant, right? So build a business case, know where you're going, call your shots. Build an outcomes-based plan. An outcome-based plan are measurable changes in behavior that you can do within two to four weeks that you'll observe in the organization and the way the system performs or the people are operating. Elevated competence, new behaviors, things that you can measure, that you can do every two weeks, because we have to go to the table. Y'all have, anybody read Cotter's change management stuff? Yeah, Cotter talks about that. This is interesting because there's like a Cotter, Prosky, Prosci, whatever sort of, of debate in the world around um, what change management is. This is organizational change. This is like a Cotter game. Get a small batch, go prove it, earn trust to go move the next one. Right? Um, we have to wrap personal and individual change inside of it as well. We have to take care of people's feelings, their wear, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability. The reinforces kind of go together on the back end of both. But you're playing at least two games in this model. So build an outcomes-based plan. Every change management model in the world, and also how we build software, calls for smaller chunks with measurable progress. So outcomes-based plan. You can't run them all concurrently. You've got to prove something. Set up a cadence to review progress and results and engage your executives in a pur pur purposeful way. Give them, create a hole in their heart for this new world. Go in with the things that get in the way and ask for their help to move them. Show them the benefit of doing it and once you get something moved, go deliver the thing you said you would. Because you can burn down trust faster than you can earn it in most organizations, especially early on. All right, so don't overreach, don't get dogmatic. Don't get too ivory tower pie in the sky. Just go prove something, because the game we're playing is earning trust over time and getting our executives to understand it. The real wins early on is somebody goes, oh, I freaking get why we have these teams stable now. Like it never made sense to me before, but I've got that one. So that's like a real win for us in the change, right? So all the things y'all talked about at the beginning, executives don't get it, they don't trust us, they're afraid. In this model, we're burning all those things down a little bit at a time, not all at once. We're very purposefully paying attention to all the fears and concerns and resistance and obstacles. And our plan of these outcomes is not just to get a change in behavior in the organization, it's to get people to believe it differently. Like that's the game we're playing. And it has nothing to do with Agile, except it has everything with Agile because it's exactly what you're doing with your product when you're trying to move into a new market or a new place in your organization. It's the same game. Um, transparently demonstrate progress and refine the plan to ensure we deliver on the business case. I can't get this done in, by March, not gonna happen. Let me get what you've got now that you never had before. I've got three options, I know it's going south sideways, I know exactly what trade-offs we have to make to make it work. What do you choose to do? Because I'm not gonna make the call, it isn't appropriate for me to make that strategic call at this point. All right, that's your call. So you bring them into it, let them make the shift, that creates ownership and shifts ownership to your executives and your directors and your managers and makes it very tangible in real form. Um, was that worthwhile? I got 10 minutes for questions and answers. I know you guys got to make this real. Um, tangible enough or too soft or actionable? Yeah, let's, let's, let's take some questions and make it real actionable. If you want the slides, it's here. Uh, I was just putting my hands up. Oh, oh cool. Um, if you want the slides, um, they're here. You can download them. Um, a lot of this stuff is on our, on our blog site. If you want to go to the blog site, if you want to get a newsletter from now on, when you accept the thing, click on the little box. Just please send me stuff forever. Um, if you don't, that's cool. We'll still get the slides. Um, but this is, uh, this is, to me, what's really interesting is the game that we're playing now is an organizational transformation, organizational change game. The game that we're playing now 
is, um, is not just an agile game or a technical skills game or competence in the craft game. All those things are critical. You can't show up and not do what you say you're going to do, but it's insufficient. If we can't get the organization behind us to move, we're going to continue to get boxed in. And then what's interesting is when you don't get the support that you didn't ask for in an effective way and your initiative fails, whose fault is it? That's not the executive's fault. If you didn't ask him in an appropriate way and didn't buy him in and didn't have him owning it, we end up carrying the weight for it too, right? So this is a whole flipping of the game. All right, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how, do, or how does predictability and innovation, this, I can see how those ideas can also clash. Okay. Um, if predictability means that I'm going to tell you exactly up front what I'm going to do and never vary from it, then you have to leave enough slack in the system to bring an innovation in. But what if predictability means this? Given everything I know today, this is the roadmap and I'm going to hit it. And if you bring something new in, I can tell you exactly what the impact will be on the roadmap. I can tell you what's going to shift. I'm going to drop this in. I'm going to deliver that when I said I would. I'm going to deliver what it, before what I said I would. And the stuff that comes after it, we'll be able to plan together. So predictability doesn't mean nothing changes. Predictability means that when I push here, it, pr it predictably pops out over there. So I understand the performance of my system. And I think we get hung up on that. This, this, this desire to not use like terms of like roadmaps or any Gantt charts or any sort of, because we're afraid to put anything out because it becomes a commitment. And no, do you know why those things are commitments today? Because the only way anything gets through our systems is by escalation and bullying and pushing the heck out of the system. Right? What if we just predictably did what we said we would do every time? And if it changes, it changed predictably. So that's why that, that, that's that thread between predictability and innovation for me. If you want to slide that in, you can. I've created an option for you to slide it in because I know these things will be done. I know this thing can move here. I'm not working on everything at the same time, delivering it all in December, right? So I can, I can bump those back in the stack. I can drop that one in. You'll get it then. Here's the impact we will have on that stuff. Here's the impact on procurement and contracts, whatever it's on. Like, because the system is trustworthy, I can respond to my executives in a, in a predictable way. Helpful? This is a very specific question. I work with a lot of CFOs, and you mentioned more effective capitalization. Yep. The they have with more natural is more frequent releases means that you can't capitalize the development of that asset for a longer period of time because you put a release and start to amortize. How do you deal with that when you work with accounting and financial practices? I'm going to give you three answers. The first one is they can't capitalize it today until it ships and it's consumed by the customer anyway. All I'm doing is actually getting it to the market when I said I would. So you're going to capitalize it at the same time. I may not be capitalizing it earlier, but I'm going to capitalize the whole thing when you can. But also, I can do smaller batches. I can release and have it be consumed. I can get it past the bright white line sooner. But here's what's also important about that. If there's a, there's a metric that I talk about called value density, how much of my time am I working on stuff that's capitalizable versus bug fixes versus maintenance? One of the things that we can absolutely do is we can be doing fewer bug fixes and more valuable stuff. One of the things we absolutely can do is be doing um, better implementations and less maintenance cost. So it costs less and more um, value stuff. That value density number shifts capitalization. Here's the other thing. It's why the hour question matters. They have to be able to translate the effort of these teams into capitalizable hours and not capitalizable. It's like the whole machine runs on cash and the balance sheet, right? So we have to be able to translate it. We can't say, oh, that dollar stuff is ridiculous. It is the fuel, right? But if I can predictably deliver value and I can connect myself, there's ways to go out and do it. Some, there's somebody in the room, if she wanted to raise her hand, that can give you like all the details about how to go make that work at scale in one of the biggest corporations in the world. Um, but here's the other cool thing. Fewer bug fixes, less overhead. I keep moving. I, keep, I don't know why I'm walking forward. I'm like so excited. <laughs> um, the, the, um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just that I can get more of my throughput more valuable. I have less overhead and less, less management of that work to get it through the system. That also increases capitalization. So more of my cost is going to actually producing value than dealing with moving pieces back and forth around the system. So there's like three significant levers that increased capitalization for him or her. And so, so um, and we've got a paper on it. You've got somebody in the room that's one of the experts in the world and has done it at bigger scale than almost anybody else, so. Answer your question? Yeah, I think there is some tension between current accounting policies and being able to release more frequently, but 
Yeah, you have, you, have, you have controls, you have control objectives in your organization yeah. that might have to be modified. Check this out though, fascinating. This is like, there's a thread here we're gonna pull. Your, your accounting firms know how to make that change and how to make it accountable. There's firms all over the world doing it. It's not like new. Why won't your CFO let you make that change? because they don't trust that the new system will be as predictable as the one they currently have. They don't trust they're gonna get the information out that they need or we're gonna deliver things when we say they will. They don't see the path to actually having a better capitalization model and it absolutely is because they don't trust that we can make the change that we need to make to get there. So it's not that they think you're stupid, it's that they don't believe that it's possible. It's that the risk of making the change is greater than the benefit of making the change. So you gotta play the game differently. Take a small slice, don't change capitalization policies. Show how we could measure it there. Show what it might look like. Show that we get fewer defects and have less overhead and more throughput. Go back to them and say, this is measurable, capturable, it's in my tool, it's exactly, precisely right. But this is why teams don't get to do whatever the heck they want to with their tooling. Because I have to track the work in a way it can be capitalized and expense and all that sort of stuff appropriately. So we're gonna make some rules around it. So there's a whole piece there, go prove it in a slice and get him to want it or her to want it. And then do it more broadly. And it is an interesting problem at huge scale because there is a point where you can't pivot until you've done enough of it. And then if you've done enough of it, then you have to pivot, but you love some stuff working the old way, you gotta cover up the old stuff. So it is a, it is a hassle for that group to, to manage that at, at a certain scale. Gotta have a plan, gotta prove it, gotta earn the trust. Thank you. So the answer may be similar to what you were just saying, but how do you convince leaders that the traditional PMO and project-based budgeting is essentially antithetical to what we're trying to do with that. We're predicting in November of this year, down to the Gantt chart level, what we're going to be doing next August is, is not very feasible. What we're trying to do. So there's a couple of challenges. Um, one is, I think most executives believe they have to be more agile, believe they have to respond more adaptively to the market. What they don't believe is that what we're doing will give them that. So what they're fighting against is not being more adaptable to the market in a sustainable fashion. What they're fighting against are local optimized, um, what results in a lack of transparency and clarity sort of model that creates risk for them. They're dying for an answer. And they're reading the literature, and the literature's going, executives are stupid, managers are bad, you get what you get when you get it. That's what they're reading. And they just go, this won't work, where should I look now? Let's go to safe. Well, you know, so that's, there, there's like a thing there. There's branding and marketing around that. And in fact, it works in the right circumstances with the right support. You know, it, it's better, but it may not be perfect. I don't know if there's any anti-safe people. I'm not meaning to be negative to safe. I'm just saying that, 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 that one of the reasons why that is successful as a brand, it's branding and marketing because it sounds like it solves that problem. And it may not be the right answer for everybody. But that's why it crosses the chasm. Anything else? Good. On uh, developing a incredible plan. I, I once had a, a exec tell me, uh, hope is not a strategy. It's on my, it's on my signature, yeah. Same thing, right? Yeah. I loved it. So, uh, thoughts? Yeah, so, if any, this is like, this is like a 10 hour talk, whole class. Um, I believe, I believe that organizations are complex systems. I believe that complex systems have constraints that operate that limit the performance of the system. I believe that we have enough information and insight that we can look at most systems and identify the next constraint. I can look at, I can go, makes no sense to get great at this when I can't even deliver a sprint on time. Makes no sense to change my funding model when I don't even know what value looks like to my organization. There's like a series of steps to this. I think we've proven that to be generally true over the last 13 years, right? So. Think about what's the next constraint, what's the next obstacle, what's the next thing you have to move, and those are the outcomes. And you break it down and prove it a little bit at a time. The wheel, there's a whole, there's a whole thing behind that wheel that will walk you around why it goes in that order. And, and, and then you go around a second time, then a third time, then a fourth time. But that wheel will begin to explain to you, in my experience and the, thing that I've, the stuff I've published, just why that matters that way. It's constraint-based. I think it's a lot of the terminology we're using, too. When we go in and say, you just got to trust the team. And you, and it's you know, ridiculous. Yeah, we don't know what's going to happen next. Well, yeah, maybe we don't, but you can't say that because it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on how do you dive into, 
Building trust is great. There's always a linchpin that can make it so that you can somehow find that tool to start building that trust. For me, it's always been a code owner's file in GitHub and that you get a lot of audibility. But how do you figure out the deepest fear about moving forward when you don't have enough opportunity to speak directly with an executive? Because that's a really personal thing that usually hides the fear that's behind the fear that's behind the fear yeah. that they're actually trying to resist. So my personal experience, um, I work my network. I find somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. And I try to earn trust with that person. And I give them the opportunity to go have it. I might coach them on it. I might go with them for the next conversation. And then navigate up. When I, when I was at, I, I just haven't been internal. I, if the two internal jobs I've had in my life, I was CIO. So I didn't, like I said, I'm basically unemployable. Um, so I haven't, I haven't navigated my way up that. But as a consultant, I've navigated up. And inside of consulting firms, I've navigated that up. And so you find the person that you can trust. You're very strategically um, surgical about building your influence network. And you understand what you're good at and what you're not, and you don't write influence checks on what you can and can't do. Am I out of time? Is that what that meant? Are you waving at me? Oh, I just, she was waving her hands. I was concerned. Am I, am I over time? Okay, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see everybody. Um, thank you so much.